Okay. Looks like people are starting to log in. So we'll give a couple seconds for people to get in and then I'll do introductions. Hi everybody, welcome to BU. Today we will be doing a webinar about getting into galleries and how to promote yourself and how to maintain those relationships and network. Uh, today we have Susan Hoffer joining us, uh, who some of you might have seen on our last Zoom session at last week. Uh, and she's in Lake Placid right now and is an artist that we are showing in the Eco Gallery. And Susan, would you like to say anything else? No, I'm just happy to be here. And it's great to be talking with Kelsey again about yeah. art. <laughs> yeah. And I am the exhibition manager and curator at VIEW. And I am also an artist as well. So I hope that my insight on both sides can help in this discussion. OK, great. Uh, so, Susan, I wanted to start off just by talking about how you start to make your work. I think that's important that we just discuss that before we even get into, you know, maintaining connections and things like that. So mostly I start with, you know, my ideas and my ideas are often just centered around the things that are important to me or things that I notice. Um, from my, I look in my environment, um, I think about people that I interact with, you know, so my art comes from my experiences, you know, and that's kind of basically where I start. I, then I think about the materials, of course, you know, and I, I love paint. I love everything about oil paint. And so that's kind of um, where I start, you know, the idea and then, of course, the material. Yeah, and I think that's an important part of it is using the material you like and that you're drawn to, not forcing yourself into any type of medium as well. Right, and I, and I, I know there's always some new kind of material that, you know, is very popular or very, um, you know, in the now kind of thing. And I, you know, I toy with branching out and, you know, because every artist wants their work to be relevant. You know, I, I think about digital, um, you know, additions to my art or, you know, maybe I should work more with Photoshop or something, you know, um, contemporary. But I, um, you know, I just stick with what I love and that has served me well, um, rather than trying to reinvent things or ways of expressing myself, you know. Yeah, great. So how did you first start showing your work? So when I first started, um, it was after I had a body of work, like I had lots of paintings to choose from. And then I started mostly by joining uh, galleries or art centers and participating in their member shows. It was a, a great way for me to get my confidence up and just to see what other people were doing, you know, and um, that was a big factor. You know, I did in in um, the early years, I did that for many years, actually, before I tried to enter, um, you know, juried shows, you know, so it wasn't even just art center, an art center, I, I showed everywhere that I was given an opportunity um, libraries, hallways, and schools, um, you know, pop-ups, you know, any, I never turned anything down. I was super grateful, you know, for opportunities to show in coffee shops, um, 
you know, it just didn't, it never mattered to me where. It was just great to put it, put what I was doing and what I loved up on the wall. And so that's pretty much how I started. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important to know you, you need to start somewhere and also being open to different opportunities is always great as an artist. Absolutely. And I'm still open, you know, to opportunities, just this, the same opportunities where I started, you know, um, I, I, you know, really don't ever say no, you know, and I'm often eagerly searching out, you know, opportunities, doesn't matter where. Yeah. Yeah. How often are you applying to jury shows or open calls? So I have a rule, um, you know, I, I apply and apply and apply until I receive 50 rejections. So normally, you know, I, I'll apply to say 50 and maybe get one or two yeses. And, you know, I just keep plugging along. I, you know, um, I read about venues, I think, okay, where, would an audience receive this well? What gallery would receive this well? I'm a figurative painter, uh, an oil painter, you know, so I stay away from exhibitions that, where the, the venues are more focused on other media or other styles, etc. you know, so it's, you know, I just, um, just keep plugging, you know? Yeah, and I think that research element is important to knowing where you should apply because there's definitely venues that won't suit every artist. Yeah. So making sure looking at past shows, most places have archives on their website so you can see what type of work has been shown. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, that, and it's a lot of work. You know, I sometimes I'll spend... I'll divide my day if, you know, in half and I'll spend, you know, say maybe four hours just researching venues or applying. Um, I keep everything in a folder. Um, and so when I get the rejections, I just date, you know, what, you know, what the response was and when it occurred. And then each year, I'll just recycle and, and send new work in, you know, a new artist statement, you know, especially venues that I was, that I'm interested in. Like I've always admired the exhibitions at The View. Um, I heard about The View from a, um, a friend who had a solo show here. He was, he's a photographer and um, he spoke ve very highly of the experience. And so I said, well, I'm going to apply. You know, I did the research. I saw that there were many types of exhibitions. And I think I applied five or six times before Catherine um, reached out and said, you know, we might be interested. Let's have a conversation. And so I, I just don't get to, I, I mean, of course, I feel discouraged sometimes, but I just know that it's all part of it. You have to be strong. Um, you have to not be critical of yourself, you know? Um, yeah, of course. And, and knowing that you may not have been the fit for that time is important. Right. Yeah. Sometimes I even, if I'm rejected, for example, from, and I say rejected, but, you know, I get it. I don't get into it. Um, a residency, you know, I, I always am curious, well, how many, about how many people applied, you know, um, and, and sometimes there's, there's an awful lot, you know, so the other thing I do is sometimes the, the gallery or the residency will tell you why they'll say, well, if you're interested in knowing why, you know, let us know. And I have to gulp and think, oh boy, here comes the criticism, you know, but I always respond and say, well, I would love feedback. Mm -hmm. And the feedback is really helpful. 
you know, sometimes it's as simple as you, you know, you need to push a little bit more, or if you're going to your work a little bit more, or if you're going to, you know, show work, show, show more of a range of work, mm. or you need to refine your artist statement a little bit, what your work is saying and what your artist statement is saying aren't really matching up you know or sometimes I've heard you know be careful with jargon you know art jargon speak in your voice even if your voice is much simpler don't use catchy words you know um so a lot of it has been super helpful just getting the feedback it's sometimes hard but you know it's, I yeah, think it's and not being afraid of it it's just there to help you be better for your next application mm -hmm. absolutely so there's always lots of reasons and you know um that sometimes you you know are accepted into one venue versus another venue and each time i've learned um, you know, I'm, I'm not looking for a fan club. I'm looking for a real uh, conversation about how is my work relevant and does, is it causing you some curiosity, you know, about mm -hmm. your own experiences? Is, is it giving you something to sort of chew on? And um, it's, it's, you don't always have answers, you know? Yeah, of course not. And then curiosity is one of the biggest traits with an artist and greatest traits. And it keeps pushing our work to be better. And, and that eventually leads to more gallery shows or more residencies. Sometimes, right? And sometimes you have like a period of maybe a couple of years where you know, you're just, I'm living off of juried shows or, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of thing that waxes and wanes, but it, the joy that I have in, in working is really why I do it. It, it's, you know, there's, it's my work in the studio. Um, and I spend about four to six hours a day, most days painting. Um, you know, it's, it's me time. It's, it's thoughtful time. It's pleasurable. It's, it's not work. You know, sometimes I listen to podcasts while I'm painting. Sometimes I listen to music. So it's not any just, it's not just one thing, you know. Um, it's a bunch of things that I'm enjoying doing. The solitude you know, the quiet, um, time slows down. Um, mm -hmm. Being in the studio gives me an opportunity to reflect on things that are important to me. I, I feel like I, I want to be a voice for, for others, for, you know, but first I have to be a voice for myself. Yes. So and I saw something you said earlier, it's very interesting where you divide your day into more kind of the business side of things versus the making side. And that's uh, one way I sometimes will actually just set aside a whole day in a week and that will be my day to do things like that. That's a wonderful way to do it. This way, um, you know, you're not interrupting your studio practice if you're on a roll. Yes. You know? <laughs> I just have divide the day just because um, sometimes I need a break from the hard work of uh, writing applications. It's, yeah. it's tedious gathering your slides and, you know, keeping everything in order, rewriting artist statements, writing opening letters. For me, that's the hard part. The treat is in the studio. Yes, yeah, oh, definitely. So important. Yeah. 
So what type of review process do you do for yourself in order to solidify and clean up artist statements and applications? So I usually, well, I do have a process. Um, I usually just sort of write without editing. Um, I look at what other artists are saying, you know, um, uh, especially artists that I admire. I, um, I listen to podcasts where artists talk about their, their work, you know, so I, I'm looking, you know, to sort of connect with artists that are really authentic in, in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Then um, I'll do a second draft and a third draft, try to um, make sure that I'm succinct and I'm clear. I try to make sure that in my artist statement, that, but that my artist statement does three things. The first is tell a little bit about the work, give clues to the work. Then I try to... Um, connect my work historically to maybe you know its heritage where where other artists have come before me you know and laid the ground for what I'm doing and then the third thing is um, to make sure there's enough in the artist statement that a person not looking the, at the work would understand the work for example, words like I'm a figurative painter, I use interior spaces, um, I like a light, I like to use light as a metaphor, um, I use thick brushwork and textured paint. So those are my kind of three things that I, you know, consider for each statement, I think that's helped me, you know, yeah, so. And that cohesiveness is extremely important because if you're on a jury panel and you're reading a statement, you're looking away from the work, you want to be able to have those words remind the juror that that's the same work because they're looking at anywhere from 100 to 400 pieces of work when they're juring, uh, depending on the venue. And, you know, you need to make sure those things really align and you have a strong hold when you put that application in. You don't want to have, I think jargon when you're saying that is a really good explanation because a lot of people can fill, fill up a lot of space with a lot of different words that actually isn't that relevant to their own work. I think that's very wise. Yes, I think you said that beautifully, Kelsey. Um, I think sometimes, and I keep it short as yeah, well. Yeah, concise, very good. You know, um, but the last thing I do is I have the luxury of being, um, uh, my partner is an English teacher. It's <laughs> so- That's uh, awfully lucky. <laughs> so um, not only do I share my artist statement with other people that are not artists, you know, I, um, I mean, I, sh I really do share it. I say, does this make sense, you know, to you? Um, but he goes, my, my husband will go through it and he always finds something, mm. you know, um, and that has been super helpful. So I, I think to have others read your statement and um, someone who's really good with English, um, you know, writing is super helpful. And I think it's important not to necessarily pick friends that won't take a risk in hurting you. You know, yes. you, you really don't do yourself a favor, I think. You know, if people are saying, oh, that's great, or, you know, it doesn't mean they have to say it's horrible, but, you know, give constructive advice. Um, I've had um, my, my one friend is a, is a psychologist, 
and um, a counselor. And I often give my work, my statements to her, and she finds things um, like she'll say, move this paragraph, not from the top to the bottom and move this one up to the middle. And, you know, and that's super helpful. That it's easier to follow your train of thought if you do that. So you need kind, constructive, and organized friends. <laughs> you really do. <laughs> yeah. And you know, there, there, you're right. There is different parts of these statements and applications when you're writing. It's not just grammatical errors you're looking for. It's also that order is very important. Do you grab the attention right away? Uh, because if someone's reading through that many applications, they might not even read all of them all the way through. If it's a page long, like for a residency, mm -hmm. they they might just be doing brief ones. But if you capture that attention right at the start, they'll do a more in-depth reading. And and I, when I'm asked, you know, when, when a, a residency or a gallery or an art center um, wants... An art, an artist statement, for example, I um, always will tweak it a little bit to my proposal. Like I just, I mean, I'm, I'm always working, I'm always writing, or I pick work specifically for, you know, based on my conversation with the curator. Um, sometimes I'll say, well, why don't you pick go look on my website i and i know that we talked about this at another time but um i i make sure that i'm not difficult to work with that is super important that um i'm flexible i'm pleasant i don't present a big ego of you know just where people are uncomfortable with me you know, I'm grateful and I'm not embarrassed to say, hey, I'm utterly thrilled and I'm utterly grateful. And sometimes people say, well, why are you saying that? You know, you're very good. Art. You're a very good artist. You know, we're grateful. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm really grateful. <laughs> like, I need to say that, you know. Um, so and, and that is, you know, keeping connections going and having long lasting connections in this world being a, just a good, good person to work with, be a good egg, you know, nobody wants a rotten egg in the, in the mix. Right. And, and the other thing is, it may be the, sh the exhibition might be the most important thing to me in the whole world, but it's important to realize that the gallerists and the curators and the directors, they have a very big job, you know, they, are working 60 to 80 hours a week, talking to lots of different artists and, you know, and often they're tired. And um, mm -hmm. so I, I try not to suck up all the air in the, in the room. I, I yeah, try. That's, that's an interesting note. It's a lot of galleries uh, have more than one show happening at a time view. It can be anywhere from three to four shows at a time. And, uh, you know, gallerists, exhibition managers, we're, we're talking to everyone almost in a day. You know, it's a lot of attention in different places. But when you are the person that is nice to speak with and nice to deal with, you, yeah. your attention is almost wants to go to that person because they're lovely to be around and lovely to work with. And you probably get work done quicker with them just because things are easy. Yes, I think so. Yeah. And and you want everyone to have a good experience. You want the viewer to enjoy the work, but you want the person and those that are, you know, putting the work up and have skills that I don't have, you know, marketing and, I mean, I was so grateful for the way that you, hung the show, Kelsey. Thank you. I knew how hard it it was, how heavy the paintings were. And, you know, I was really grateful to 
you know, when I saw it, I thought, wow, I don't know that I would have been able to put it all together with that same eye. So I was, you know, and, and, and it wasn't just my show, you did two other exhibitions at the same time. Yep, know? it's, uh, it's definitely, at VIEW we have so many different things happening and then we have programs going on with it. So, but then we also have a marketing manager, Travis, who's incredible and does a lot of the promotion, which like in your case, it's good because a lot of that gets handed over to the gallery. And then you're able to, there's a, there's a beneficial relationship between the artist and the gallery. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like teamwork, you know? Yeah, it very much is. And, and then even with installing larger shows at VIEW, we have volunteers uh, and then, you know, we have facility managers. So it really is teamwork. I'm not going to know everything about promoting in a gallery as much as like down to the, how do you actually sync up a program to send out a social media post? You know, so there's there's someone that knows how to do that. Uh, and then maybe you write the content or the artist writes the content. So it really is teamwork. I think so. I mean, that's my experience, you know? Do you um, do any promotion yourself on your end? I work on my website, you know, um, and, but I don't seek out, you know, um, sort of other than, you know, I mean, I don't invite people too, too often into my studio. I'm not really good at that sort of thing. I, you know, um, I've never been a gallerist. I've never been in, worked in a museum. So um, I'm okay with that because I do know that you know, we all have different strengths. Um, what I do is I apply to things with, and I, you know, I guess in a way that's how I promote myself. And, you know? and you did hit the point of a website. That's extremely important as an artist. I think it's almost near impossible to be an artist working nowadays without one. Yes. That's the first kind of, Point of call when you get somebody's name on your desk and you want to look at their work you immediately go to a website yes yes and I keep things that are personal off my website I just make it about my work I you know I set it up in pages so if someone's interested in process they can go to that page or paintings that page you know so I, I try I try to keep it super updated and organized. I've got about five paintings to add to my website currently. So I have someone that helps me with my website. So I just make appointments like three or four times a year with this web designer. And, you know, I, I look at it and add to it. So, yeah. you know, that's that's great you are able to work with someone to do that some people if they're at the start and they need to have that for promotion of themselves can can do it on their own that's how I started I have had some help as I got further in my career but everyone is capable of having a website there is a, a lot of help online you can watch YouTube how to you know use Wix or Squarespace uh, so yeah it's it's a pretty important aspect and it is great when you get to the point where you can hire someone to help you, but you can do it at the beginning on your own. Absolutely. And for years I managed my own and then, you know, probably eight or nine years I, I managed my own and now I'm, I, you know, I can manage the current, the current one, but there are things that I'm, I can't do. And you know, and the person I go to is a friend as well. So it's not, it's not like I'm, you know, paying a whole lot. So yeah, I have a husband that can help you write statements and then a friend with the website. You've really got a good bunch there. <laughs> Absolutely. Very grateful. 
Yeah, it is, but it is reaching out to the community is an important part of the art world and the people around you. Yes. And, you know, looking on uh, online for things like this where that are free and available to the public, we, we have more throughout the next couple of weeks. One of them is writing artist statements. So, and that's just, that's free and anyone can join. So, you know, there is ways to improve even if you're at a low budget when you're starting off. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and I participated in all of those. I mean, learning what you're describing, how to write an artist statement, um, you know, how to set up a web page. There were so many free opportunities. Um, you know, how, you know, how to uh, look for galleries you know, what kinds of questions to ask the gallerists, what work to send when you're inquiring, you know, what to say. There's so much. You don't have to um, embarrass yourself by reinventing the wheel, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, and it is never reinventing the wheel totally. You can use old copy of things and just updating, doing different versions. And like you said, reorganizing is important. So, I mean, getting back to our original point, you know, um, about how do you apply to galleries? Um, I would just say, you know, start small, um, look for local opportunities, um, use those opportunities to see what other people are doing. Um, often I would, if I liked somebody's work, I would write their name down and I would look up their website, you know, for a website. So I would research about that person. I got to know people um, in that way, you know, by looking up their work on their website. I would go to uh, receptions, gallery receptions. And even though I, I feel shy, I mean, we all kind of are a little bit, most of us are, um, or, and nervous. I would just force myself to, to just go and be friendly with, you know, the artist who's showing their work, even if it's something as simple as, you know, I really like this exhibition or, you know, that painting over there is just beautiful. And so I began to just feel more like I had a community when I did those things. And then the other two things are just, you know, keep applying until you um, have exhausted everything you know um, or, you know, every place, you know, and, and, you know, set your sights high, pick a high number. Like I do 50, but my husband is a writer. He does a hundred venues when he's got a hundred rejections. He, um, you know, he'll, um, say, okay, I really worked hard. You know? Yeah, that's that's a lot, a hundred, and just not letting it take that blow to your ego, like we said earlier, is is important. Yeah, it's part of the process, and then learn from each each opportunity, recycle the. I know. think you the keeping track is very good practice as well that you do. Where are you finding your calls mainly? Oh, that's a good question. Um, a lot on Facebook. I look up uh, art centers and galleries. They often have on Instagram or Facebook um, their, you know, their pages, and they put their calls up there. So okay. really, um, and that's kind of how I how I do it. Um, you know, there are if you look up calls for work online, you'll see that there's um, different places that will list calls. Um, I even find some on Instagram as well, just by following galleries that have, like you said, like, 
work like your own absolutely and post their calls yes yes and so after I sort of re I get a list of galleries and it and this is where you need a whole day I'll get a I'll look up galleries in Brooklyn or good gallery you know galleries in Queens and then I'll research um, those galleries for example and if I see some that you know are looking for work similar to what I'm doing then I follow them on Instagram and so I see their calls. Another place that has been valuable for me is the painting center down in Manhattan. So, um, you know, I, um, you know, I follow their posts for, for work. And, you know, so that's been super helpful. Another thing is to follow artists, friends. Mm -hmm or even artists that I admire. I do that, I'll spend a day looking up artists that I admire on Instagram. And, you know, sometimes um, they will post, oh, they got into this show or they got into this residency. And I think, oh, and then I check it out and I'll apply maybe a year later. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of, a lot of that, and there's no right way to do it, but I know that I have to do it. Yeah, and uh, I was just thinking your the painting, uh, what was it called in Manhattan? Oh, the painting center in Manhattan. Center. There's things like members, like, uh, so I work with glass a lot. So there's GAS, which is the Glass Art Society. And oh. you, if you're on their a member with them they just email different things of you know this is what's happening this month uh so there's a lot of different member societies you can join for different mediums yes. and they'll let you know they're almost doing part of the work for you by just being a part of their membership so that's yeah. another good way absolutely i also uh joined praxis it's um a center for aesthetics it's run by Brainerd, and I don't remember his last name, but he will, uh, you can get his emails, and he will uh, let you know what, uh, where there are calls for work, mm -hmm. opportunities for grants, and so I read that. He sends something every two weeks, I believe. And he and helped what's his name again. Uh, his name is Brainerd. Um, let me just oop. just in case if anyone was wanted to write it down. Yeah, uh, Praxis P R A X I S, the Praxis Center for Aesthetics, and he's he kind of runs it. He's brilliant. He helped me write an artist statement uh, about three years ago. And um, that was really good experience. Yeah. Oh, that's kind of like taking a class. Yeah. And there, there is classes you can take for, I do know uh, View were having a social media uh, class that you can take about as artists or authors and how you promote yourself. So it's another opportunity we have going on. I, I was going to ask, once you've made these connections with galleries, how do you maintain your relationships and how valuable do you find in like keeping that relationship going even after you're not showing somewhere? So I make an effort to go to other artists' receptions. I don't always get out as often as I would like. But a couple of times a year, I will, you know, show up and, you know, just make a point to, you know, meet people and say hello and, you know, uh, support what, what they're doing apart from me, you know, what they did for me, you know, I think that's super important, you know, and all of the venues are mostly on the weekends. So, 
you know, a Friday or a Saturday. So it's easy to just leave a couple of weekends a month. I mean, it's doing things that I would want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And that is a form of promotion outside of the artists doing their own promotion on social media and then working with the gallery. Being in person is a way of promoting yourself. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You did ask in terms of promotion. I do have an Instagram and a Facebook page, and I do post current work um, on those pages. Someone um, I just saw in the chat asked, doesn't the gallery want the artist to promote themselves in their shows, social media activity? And of course, of course we do. And yes. if there's ways we can help do that by giving our marketing material over postcards or things that's also a relationship that happens i and i see another question juried shows usually have an entry fee do you do 50 applications at 30 that's a really good question at 30 dollars each residencies mostly don't have an application fee juried shows do many shows don't um our centers don't mm -hmm. so I, I mix it up um the other thing um i do is um i work part-time a couple of days a week and i just set aside that money um for application fees um i write applications for grants which sometimes you'll get a lump sum and you can use those for art materials um i keep um records um of everything i spend for my taxes yeah um, so it's it's almost like running a small business Sometimes I do not apply to shows um, where, you know, it's $50 or $40, you know, sometimes I have to make choices. You know, I allow myself a certain amount each month. Yes, that's, that's what I do as well. I make a budget of how much I can spend either in a month or like a quarter at a time just so that I don't go over budget and then it goes into material cost. So there, there is a, a balance there. Uh, I did see someone had another question. Is sending out so many applications, has it ever happened that two places accept you for the same slot? And if so, how would you handle that? That, that can definitely happen. That, yes. So yeah. I have a large body of work so before I start applying, um, I make sure that I have enough work and that I'm not applying using the same artwork for um, duplicate shows that overlap. Yes. And that's, so for that, I use a spreadsheet. You know, sometimes it may not be the, uh, I may not be able to use a work that I really would love to use because it's been accepted into another venue. And so I will use a, a different work to apply. But remember, I'm getting a lot of um, rejections. So it, it doesn't really happen um, to me. I, I've actually coincidentally just have had this happen in this next couple months. Uh, oh, no. Yep. Yeah. And it's a one day overlap. So I did reach out to the gallery and just asked, could it be a day late? And they were okay with that. But if it was any more than a day, I probably wouldn't have reached out or wouldn't have submitted the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, so that keeping a spreadsheet is important. Also, if it happened that you did get accepted in two things and there was overlap and you really wanted both, you can professionally reach out and say, this has happened. Is there another piece of work you might want? But it matters if it's a select show, a large show, it depends. 
Because if you're one of, you know, 50 people in a show, they're probably just going to say, no, then you're not in. Or, you know, we don't really have time to accommodate for that. Or the juror didn't see it, so we can't accept it. Mm -hmm. So it does matter on the situation and the circumstance of which, where, and how you applied. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, be careful. So you don't, you don't want to get a reputation as, you know, sort of, you know, doing that. Mm -hmm. It Either. can come off as flaky and just uh, unorganized and, and you don't, you don't want that. People want you to be on top of it and predictable because you, you said it a little while ago, being an artist is almost like having a small business. And I, I do look at it in that way sometimes as well. You have to handle things as if you are a business, particularly right. professional relationships, but you know, don't forget your personality is there. Right. And, and we're human, we make mistakes. People understand the occasional mistake, you know, but like you say, Kelsey, you, you don't want to be unpredictable. Yeah. And people, I think, expect you to run your business like a business, you know, the, it, yeah, it's lots of fun in your studio sometimes or you can get lost in the process, but you still need to come up for air if you want to participate um, in showing work. Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes in art school isn't always a taught thing about how much isn't just studio making time. And I think as people come out of art school or they go into it without an education, start to realize, oh, I actually have to be quite business-minded for this as well. I think colleges try to help young students by, you know, professors give deadlines and there are consequences um, for not meeting a deadline um no matter what right so yep. we both experience that so, of course so I mean people try and it's also a part of just like you say being organized and mature in approaching your your work or approaching the promotion of your work as a business you know Yes, uh, I was just going to say it. some people have already asked questions, but if anyone else has any questions, feel free to enter them into the chat now uh, as we're getting near a close. Just wanted to remind people of that. Uh, so Su Susan, I was wondering as well, once you've gotten into a place, when do you decide you can start promoting that you're actually going to be in that show, uh, just because some people might not be aware of how that works and different timing. So I wait, I take my cue from the gallery. I um, often, like I don't promote myself before, um, they do. And what I will do is once I see that they're advertising, I will uh, share the promotion with my, with, you know, like a Facebook page or Instagram or some other, an email to friends, and I will use their advertising, um, not my own, um, you know, to, to promote the show. I, you know, I will say to some close friends, oh my goodness, you know, I hope you'll be around, you know, for this, it would be lovely to see you at, a, at this reception. Um, but I really, I try not to overstep myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I try to be super respectful and every, uh, gallery does it differently. Yep. I, I've signed some contracts before where it, it says, do not announce this until we like let you. So, you know, paying attention to those contracts and how you can promote their gallery. Maybe you need to use their logo when you're doing it or anytime you publish material in reference you need to include that they supported you there's different things like that that are worth looking at and paying attention to 
Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have another question. Oh, this is a nice one. I'd love to hear which podcast you're listening to if you know the titles. Oh my That's goodness. <laughs> so, um, oh, now I'm really on the spot. I'm going to look at <laughs> ideas. I know. I, I love ideas. Mm -hmm. So they're all on my... And uh, when me and Susan were talking so recently, she also noted that she does a lot of research and reading. I'll just, when you're outside the studio, which is also very informative to writing your own statements and things like that. Absolutely. Um, so I listened to the Great Women Artists podcast, and so it's with Caddy Hessel, and she's currently interviewing Sarah Z. That is such an excellent um, um, podcast. I listened to um, the Gray Area um, with Sean Illing. Um, the Atlantic Magazine in audio, although sometimes those can be a little boring. <laughs> you know, we were not listening. <laughs> um, Tapestry by CBC Radio. Um, let's see. The Daily, the New York Times Daily. Um, I listened to that one as well. Diane Rehm, I love Diane Rehm. She does such great interviews and she's just been around forever. Um, and, and, I'll call, and then I um, do uh, books on tape. So I just finished Barbara Kingsolver's Demon Copperhead. It's a really good book. It's, she's been, talking about it and promoting it and it's supposed to be really it, it was just life-changing oh, for me okay. I learned so much about Appalachia and just the issues that the people face there I like to paint um, people in my community my rural community you know and I'm trying to give voice to my neighbors, family, my friends. Barbara Kingsolver did this with Appalachia where she lives. Um, she talked a lot about the opioid crisis and just was really giving voice to how the people, you know, felt about their struggles, why and how. So. Great, it's, yeah. it's incredible how you can find another art form that you still connect to even if it's not the same as yours yes well we were talking before we both are taking music lessons yes <laughs> you know? so I mean there's just a sense of I have a sense of curiosity about the world and I don't want to be rigid in the lens that I use I want to be open to the way people feel and just changes that are necessary, right? To live a, an authentic life. And I think that's very evident in your work. You can see that. And I, I do love that you have written statements with your work. It helps lift them up and you get to know a little more detail about it. Thanks. Yeah. So I don't wanna present myself as somebody who's, oh yeah, I've got all the answers. I'm just as scared as the next guy. Every time I write an application, I'm thinking, what the heck? What am I doing? You know, was this a wasted three hours or something? But I know that um, if I believe in my work, that I, I need to um, find ways to promote my work. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's good to not think about any of that time wasted because it's always that you're just improving yourself and your practice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, failures do help you become better. And on a humorous note, 
um, when I first write, started writing my, um, my artist statements, my husband would always say, gosh, Susan, you have an, a comma problem. <laughs> <laughs> and after, you know, 15 years of doing this, he says, I'm getting better. At my comma. I have a comma problem too. So I know how you feel, Susan. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions that have come in. Um, I think we've covered quite a bit. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, no, just that it was just fun talking with you and getting to know you, Kelsey. And I'd like to thank Catherine. And I'm know. sure she's watching, so she hears you out there. <laughs> you know, I think I was a little more nervous this time than last time because. You know, it's easy to talk about my work, but it's hard to sort of feel like I have something to offer to other people. You know, I learn from other people. I don't feel like I have a whole lot to offer. Well, you've, you've done so well. I really, myself, I've enjoyed hearing what you've had to say, and I'll take that on board as well. So I'm glad you were able to join us. And we do have more of these in the coming weeks with different people. So it's good to see different perspectives. And I'm glad I got to do two of these with you. So, And I with you. Thank yeah. you. Yes. All right. Well, everyone, have a good night. And thank you for tuning in. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.